Jeremiah. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Jeremiah chapter uh, 33. Now I'm going to tell you that Bible prophecies speak of a coming world where peace will reign, a world of justice and righteousness, one of a, where great economic growth will happen with no unemployment, where man will finally experience harmony and tranquility. It will be a world as never seen before in our history. Perhaps only two humans, two people, did taste of this time of bliss, Adam and Eve, but it was not for long. However, many of us are about to live it and to stay in it because this world is not far at all. And we know these things because of Bible prophecies, because Bible prophecies tell us about them. Otherwise, considering our present reality, it doesn't look like it, right? Just this past week, we have noticed one more time how the world economy is so fragile with the stock market plummeting. Something is going on. We're also noticing major shifts that are happening in our world. I read yesterday in the BBC site that the Chinese authorities are now calling for a new world reserve currency to replace the US dollar following its downgrade. And the kings are the king of the east as the book of Revelation called the Oriental Nations, about to take their place in the world sin, as it was prophesied. Are we heading towards a one world currency? The title of the article I read, and that was written about the uncertainty of the world economy, was the end of the world as we know it. See that it is not only Bible believers that speak of these things. And what are the reasons of these things? What brought about this downfall? Our text today is about to reveal it, to throw some light into this crisis. What kept us from having attained this time of peace and prosperity by now? We had thousands of years to achieve it. What keeps us from experiencing blessings and happiness in our own lives? The Bible is thoroughly concerned with our well-being and it is carefully and often severely sincere in speaking of the reasons behind our present condition. This is why many do not like to read the Bible. They say it speaks of wars and repeatedly tell us how bad we are and how we should get better. But the Bible did not invent wars. It did not invent conflict nor sin. We did. By grace, it only reports these things to us so that our eyes may be opened to the reality of our present world and of the condition of our heart without Jesus. Today's language, found in many prominent newspapers, are beginning to sound like the language that we find in the Scriptures, especially when it comes to Bible prophecies. They report to us how bad the state of our planet is. But the difference is that they cannot offer you a way out. They cannot offer you hope. The Bible reports these things even before they happen so that we may turn to God who alone can give you the hope that you need so you can go over these things. And once again, today we turn to the history of Israel. God has chosen Israel not only for blessing but also as an example of what it is like to be away from God. The Bible is very much the history of the future of Israel from cover to cover. Her past, present, and future mirrors ours. It is almost like ours. This nation is in many ways a scout nation, a surveyor's nation. And one thing that is important is that all Bible prophecies links her final redemption with the coming world peace. This nation in its blessing and suffering is leading the way to the world peace. And so in the section we're about to begin to look at today, we find Israel right at the edge of a great fall. Chapter 39 of Jeremiah speaks of the destruction and burning of Jerusalem that happened back in 586 BC. For this point on, the Jews were scattered around the world as we see them today. Their present condition begins right there. And in the last 38 chapters of Jeremiah, we read where really, I want to tell you, intervals of warnings, where the final judgment was delayed over and over so that many could repent. However, the last six chapters that we're going to look at today are really extended times where God spreads out His grace and delays His judgment as much as He can do it. 
In these chapters, we will see much of the nature of man, how we often create our own reality to, con to avoid confronting the real one. And God is there, always trying to bring us back. And the text in front of us is not an easy one, but there are tremendous truths in there. And one major difficulty is that, as in many other places in Jeremiah, historical chrono chronology is not followed. Chapter 35 to 36 breaks the chronology between chapter 32 to 34 and 37 to 44, but I want to tell you it's even better. Because it shows us that God so arranged this historical event so that we may learn even more. What we have in front of us is his view of history. It is the chronology of God who lives in eternity. What matters, I want to tell you, is the continuity of the message. And the message in there is very strong. Let's begin to look at our text. Last week we have looked at the new covenant God will make with Israel. A covenant he insisted will come to be as surely and as long as the moon and the stars hang in the sky. As he said in chapter 31. And today there's another unconditional covenant with Israel that God reminds us of, something we forget. A covenant all the nation of the world will benefit from. It speaks of the covenant he made with David, leading to a government that will lead the world into a great time of peace. Let's read Jeremiah 33, verses 14 to 18. Again, peace will come not from Washington or London or Peking. It will come from Jerusalem. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will perform the good word which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time I will cause to grow up to David, a branch of righteousness, he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the world. In those days, Judah shall be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which he will be called the Lord, a righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, nor shall the priests, the Levites, like a man to offer burnt offerings before me to kindle grain offerings and to sacrifice continually. God will perform what he calls his good word for Israel and for all the nations of the world. His good word promises a righteous world government at its head, a descendant of David. Who is his descendant? None else than Jesus of Nazareth, who is a direct descendant of David. He is the one who is the branch of righteousness. He will be at the head of the government. And under him would be an earthly king, also descendant of David, because of the promise of verse 17, which says that David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. There exists today, within the nation of Israel, a family of the lineage of David, from whom this king will come. And there is also within the nation a, fam a family of the lineage of Aaron, because we see in verse 18 that he promises also a priesthood. And this is in stark contrast to the world government Bible prophecy tell us will be established here on earth before this time. The one the newspapers are beginning to see rising. And this government, headed by Yeshua, the Lord tell us, will come as surely as there is day, as there is night, as there are seasons. Read verses 20 to 23. 20 to 22, he could not have said it with a stronger illustration. It says, Thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that there will not be day and night in their season, then my covenant may also be broken with David my servant, so that he shall not have a son to reign in his throne. And with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. And the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured. So will I multiply the descendants of David, my servants, and the Levites who minister to me. This covenant promises that there will be a world government led by Jesus through Israel, as surely as there is day and night, and as surely as the immensity of the universe. Have you ever asked yourself, 
how many stars there are in the universe. You know, we know that almost all the stars in the universe are collected together into galaxies. We also know that each galaxy can contain 10 million to 10 trillion stars. How many galaxies are there? Astronomers estimate that there are approximately 100 billion to 1 trillion galaxies in the universe. And so they say that there are between 10 sextillion and 1 septillion stars in the universe. You know what that means? It means that they don't know. <laughs> you know, at this point, numbers do not mean anything because our mind cannot conceive the immensity of the universe. And so the God of the Bible knows these stars, by the way, all by name, as he says in Psalm 147. And he knows our incapacity to number them. So he says, the day you can number them, it will be, I will forsake my covenant with David and with the Levite, which means never. And this very covenant, this Davidic covenant is spoken of in the New Testament. It's not something that is past in the Old Testament. Do you remember when Gabriel met Mary? What he told her? If you go to Luke 1, 31 to 33, as you have it in the screen, see what he tells her. It says, Behold, you, shall, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, it says. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Gabriel says that Jesus will reign this world, and he will sit in the, in the throne of David and over the house of Israel. Has this happened yet? No, Jesus never ruled the world, and much less from Israel. This needs to happen. Jeremiah and Gabriel tell us that he will in the future. Again, this needs to be fulfilled. Peter also, in one of his sermons in Acts 2, and James as well, in Acts 15, spoke of his coming. James actually quoted Psalm 89, and he says in the book of Acts, he says, After this I will return and I will establish the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up. This is after that the church was built, there yet to be a covenant to be fulfilled, the Davidic covenant. So this is a promise not yet fulfilled and it would be only then where the world will find peace. And this is not all. This is something extraordinary that we read here. You know, the Messiah even gave his own title, his own name to the city from where this government will rule. Notice verse 16. Jerusalem is given a new name, that of the Messiah, the Lord, it says, our righteousness. This is how Jerusalem will be called. You know, it was back in Jeremiah 22, verse 6, that the Messiah was given this name. It was because of the corruption of the king of Israel who failed to bring Israel to see the Messiah. Here, it is for the same reason as well, for the wickedness of men. So this city of Jerusalem will be the capital city as surely as Jesus is the Messiah. Again, it does not look like it today, does it? But God bet his name on it. This name, the Lord our righteousness, also speaks of our salvation. It speaks of God's righteousness. How can one attain salvation if it is not through God's righteousness? I don't want to tell you, it cannot be ours. It cannot be yours. Heaven is too holy a place for our own righteousness to match its demands. This is why Jesus came down to die for our sins. This truth, I want to tell you, is taught throughout the Bible. From the moment God covered Adam and Eve with an animal skin because they committed their first sin to the death of the Messiah on the cross and to Jerusalem who will be called the Lord our righteousness. God is always there, always here to provide for us redemption, which really I want to tell you is a free ticket to heaven if of course we accept Jesus Christ, Yeshua Mashiach as our personal savior and we follow his commandments. You know, at the end it all amounts to this, one's salvation. And God in the scriptures is seen as always working so hard so that we may spend eternity with him. We're going to see him running after the Israelites. In fact, you know what it is? He's running after you if you do not know who Jesus is. Let's look at now the next chapter where this truth really, really comes out. 
You know, when reading these five chapters, Jeremiah 34 to 38, once again, and even stronger here, one will notice this recurring and never-ending offer of repentance from God. We've heard them all along in the last 33 chapters. Why say it again and again? You know, these five chapters could really have been written in one sentence, and then we could have gone right into chapter 39 and end the whole thing right there. But I want to tell you, God is not like that. He is so loving, He is gracious, and He is persistent. Just let me bring you to chapter 36, where God asks Jeremiah to take a scroll and write all his words. And then he says what we read in verse 3. Chapter 36, verse 3. He says, perhaps, now we're in chapter 36 here. So many times God repeated the same thing and then he comes back before chapter 39 when it ends. He says, perhaps now the house of Judah will hear all the adversity which are purposed to bring upon them that everyone may turn from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sins. As if he never said it before. Perhaps, Ula in the Hebrew, you see the humility here and the respect God has for every man. He knows all things from beginning to end, but he wants man to come and to make his own decision himself. Look at verse 7 again. And he says it again. He says, perhaps they will present their supplication before the Lord and everyone will turn from his evil way. For great is the anger and the fury that the Lord has pronounced against these people. How he wished that everyone will turn from his ways. I want to tell you the words of Jeremiah are not dead. They are alive and they still speak to all those who don't know, do not know the Messiah. God has so much love to give. He's completely love. And he so loves the world. But of course, there's a limit, right? He loves the world, but the world has to accept. He cannot force anyone to come and to believe in him. And in the process of calling his people to repentance, we learn much of the nature of man in this section. There is so much about it here. For one thing, and at least twice in this chapter, Israel was near escaping the judgment. But that at the last minute, she turned back. Let's look at the first instant. There, may, there we may recognize much of ourselves. How many times we may have found ourselves in a very difficult situation. And then we call God and we promise God that we will change and we will do this and we will do that. And when things seem to get better, we forget the promises and we turn back to where we were. We say to ourselves, maybe the whole thing was not true to begin with. Maybe I made it up in my mind. Or maybe we rely on God's infinite grace to bail us out again and again. The situation here in Jeremiah is that at some point toward the end, as the Babylonians were surrounding the city of Jerusalem, they were there, they surrounded the city. At that point, everybody was scared and the whole population made a covenant with God with the hope that the salvation from the Babylonians will occur. This covenant is related to the law of release, which says that after seven years, everyone releases their servant, and this, this was the time. Look at chapter 34, verses 8 to 10. It says, This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people who were at Jerusalem, to proclaim liberty to them, that every man should set free his male and female slave, a Hebrew man or woman, that no one should keep a Jewish brother in bondage. Now when all the princes and all the people who had entered into the covenant heard that everyone should set free his male or female slaves, that no one should keep them in bondage anyone, anymore, look what it says, they obeyed and let them go. Great, beautiful. That was great and beautiful, and surely the Lord would have blessed Israel, would have helped Israel. However, see the f first words of the next verse. But afterwards, they changed their minds. They missed it, right? They missed such blessings, but why did they change their minds? 
Why did they change their minds so fast? This is, I want to tell you, so much the nature of man when it comes to his relation with God. Why? Because we want to have something tangible to touch. Okay? God requires faith. This is what we call lack of faith. Faith, according to the scripture, is something that is real. But we exchange that, that reality for something we can touch. What happened in Israel? Where did they change their mind? You know, we learn from Chronicles and Kings, and especially from chapter 37, that at this time, at this very time, Egypt began to gather her armies to fight Babylon that was stationed around Jerusalem. And when the Jews learned this, they forgot about the covenant. They said, Egypt is going to save us. They believed that the Egyptian will save them, and they completely turned their back to God. What a tragedy. You know, we often exchange the riches of heaven against what is, again, tangible. It is sad to call on God only when we are in need. And when things seem to get better, we push Him away. That, I want to tell you, is not fair. Not only do we use Him as a spare, but when things go wrong, we accuse them of the things that are wrong. And even then, I want to tell you that God comes back to them and warns them again. He doesn't go. He doesn't get slighted. Look at Jeremiah 37, 7 to 8. See how nice the God of the Bible is. 37, 7, 8. He says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Thus you shall say to the king of Judah, Who sent you to me to inquire of me, Behold, Pharaoh's army which has come up to help you, will return to Egypt, Egypt, to their own land. And the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, shall come back and fight against this city and take it and burn it with fire. God was not slighted. He worried even more for them. God, I want to tell you, wants us. He wants us completely to Him. So He can make us whole. So that. We can connect with him. You know, the Israelites, as many of us today, missed out on such great blessings. And even after this, God's word in verse 17 of chapter 34, I want to tell you, sets the stage of the history of Israel as it is seen for the next 2,600 years. When the time of the Gentiles, as Jesus calls this time, begin. See what this verse says, an important verse. Chapter 34, verse 17. It says, therefore, thus says the Lord, you have not obeyed me in proclaiming released everyone to his brother and everyone to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim a release to you, says the Lord, to the sword, to pestilence and to famine. And I will deliver you to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth. The Israelites had not released their servant. Here God releases Israel as his servant. Instead of going to the nation as to be a light unto them, they temporarily lost their place as servant. This opened the way for Yeshua to come, who is the servant. Right? He is called the servant in Isaiah 53. He was about to do what Israel failed to do and even more. He was to bring light unto the nation and die for them. He did that through the church who was completely Jewish at the beginning. Something Israel, nation of Israel, or anyone else could not do. And notice the language spoken of in verse 17 with words like to the sword, to pestilence, to famine. Does that remind you of something? This is reminiscent of the prophecy of Moses in Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26. Even before the Jews entered their land, he says, you shall be put out of their land because of your disobedience. This is... The last chapter before the major diaspora. In fact, you have the major diaspora. You can see them in the chart. The first one is the Babylonian diaspora. This is what, again, what Jesus called the beginning of the time of the Gentiles. And then you have, and then they had, the Jews had to come back to their land in order to prepare the temple for the first coming of Jesus. And then out they went again in 70 AD. And they are still out, actually, until... Jesus comes back and they will bring them back. Today the Jews are in their land again because of and their unbelief in the same way as they came back for the first coming. So they, will, they are there right now to prepare the temple 
for the second coming of Yeshua, the temple that would be destroyed. And after this incident, God asked Jerus, the, Jer, Jeremiah that is, to do something unusual. This becomes the subject of what we read in chapter 35. He asks him to call a people called the Rechabites and to invite them to the temple to drink some wine. Now, who are the Rechabites? You know, nobody really knows. For the little information we have of them, we understand that they are descendants of the Kenites, a non-Israelite group who lived among the Jews. And apart from their mention in the Bible, there's nothing else in history that we know about them. So why would God invite these Rechabites to drink some wine? It is because they had something that the Israelites did not have. And something I want to tell you we all need to have. The reason why they were offered wine is because these people never drank wine. And the message here is that in their legalism, they were very faithful to the command of their fathers who told them not to drink wine. However, Israel, who had God as their father, did not listen to him. So these Rechabites were brought in because they had what these Israelites lacked, faithfulness and discipline. This was God's complaint to Israel. They did not listen or follow his word. So he demonstrated through this unknown group of people. See their answer. This is the type of faithfulness I want to tell you that God is requiring, is craving for us, from us. Verse 6, he says, But they said, We will drink no wine, for Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, You shall drink no wine, nor you nor your sons forever. It is as if this type of answer again, God was craving for his, from his people. And see his complaints. In verse 17, that is 12 to 15, he speaks to us as well. 12 to 16, to 15. It says, Then came the word of the Lord to Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and tell the men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will you not receive instruction and obey my words? Says the Lord. The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, which he commanded his sons not to drink wine, are performed. For this day they drink none and obey their father's commandment. But although I have spoken to you, rising early and speaking, you did not obey me. I have also sent to you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Turn now, everyone, from his evil way. Amend your doings and do not go after other gods to serve them. Then you will dwell in the land which I have given you and your fathers. But you have not inclined your ears, nor obeyed me. It did not matter that these people were legalistic in their regulations. What touched God's heart was their faithfulness, their consistency in following the precepts of their fathers. So much so that at the end, he blesses these people. In fact, in verse 19, he says to them, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not like a man to stand before me forever. Exactly what he didn't, couldn't tell, couldn't say to the kings of Israel of the time. How many times we start and we stop? Start and stop. Look at the Rechabites. As unimportant as they are in history, they caught God's attention because of their faithfulness and their strong discipline. This is what we need as believers, discipline and faithfulness to God. You know, I read the other day actually a true story. It was one stormy night. An elderly couple entered the lobby of a small hotel and asked for a room, so the clerk said that they were filled, as were all hotels in town. And then he thought, I can't send this fine couple like this out in the rain. And so he asked them, he says, would you, are you be willing to sleep in my room? So the couple he hesitated, but the clerk insisted. The next morning, when the man paid his bill, he said, you're the kind of man who should be managing the best hotel in the United States. Someday I will build one. I will build one. So the clerk smiled politely. A few years later, the clerk received a letter from the elderly man recalling that stormy night and asking him to come to New York. A round trip ticket was enclosed. When the clerk arrived, his host took him to a corner of a 
of the 5th and 34th Avenue or Street, where stood the magnificent new building. That explained the man is the hotel I have built for you to manage. The man was William Waldorf Astor, and the hotel was the original Waldorf Astoria. The young clerk, George Bolt, became its first manager. I want to tell you, this hotel is still there in New York City. It's one of the most luxurious hotels. Now, I want to tell you, I don't know if there are hotels in paradise, but this illustrates well what Jesus said in the parable of the servant. And he says it to those who are faithful, to those who are disciplined. At the end, he would say in Matthew 25, 23, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. To those who care, who are disciplined, this is what Jesus promises. Much more than the rewards of the clerk and that of the Rehabite, our God is a great God willing to share with us everything that he has. We'll be co-heir with Jesus. His whole universe, if we are faithful with him. We, like the Israelites, need to put our priorities where they should be. We need to get closer to our Creator. This is the place of our blessing. Next week, we will look at the many other things we can find in this great portion of the Scriptures. Things that would help us to see deeper into the nature of man. And especially into some of the facets of God's heart. And see how wonderful He is. And speaking of faithfulness, what better time than now to witness some baptisms? You know, I want to tell you one of the best ways to see what he did and does for us through his son Jesus comes only once in the lifetime. It is through water baptism. It is at this time when the individual is given this great privilege to publicly show his love and gratitude to Yeshua. This faithfulness and dedication is a wonderful illustration of the most, two most important events in the history of man. The death and the resurrection of the Messiah. Two events that changed the course of history and changed, are still changing the lives of those who commit themselves to Jesus. By going in the water, one symbolizes his death. By coming out of the water, one symbolizes his resurrection. That is the symbolism of the baptism. It is an identification with Jesus. As Paul describes it in Colossians 2.12, buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. This ordinance, as simple as it is, carries with it such a weight that I believe it not only is a great testimony for the people who would witness this baptism, but this act transcends the universe, I believe, to the throne of God. Baptism is then an outpouring of gratitude and thanksgiving to God for what he has done for us. And as we are considering the root of baptism, just one word about it. Back in the first century, when you, because the roots of baptism can be found in Judaism, we noticed that we, they were all done by complete immersion of the person. Today in Christianity, there's a controversy between those who insist on immersion only and those who use non-immersion modes of baptism, such as pouring or sprinkling the water. One of the best arguments is found in John 3.23. It says, now, so John also was baptizing in Enon near Salim, that is John the Baptist, because there was, nev was much water there. And they came and they were baptized. So according to this verse, John had to leave for a different place in the country because there was no much water there. If simple sprinkling were sufficient, John would have stayed there where he was, but he needed much water you know, for the body to be there. And another obvious argument, obviously, is the word bapto, baptism, which means in Greek to uh, immerse. So uh, I'm going to pray first, and I'll be asking uh, Jean-Paul and Céline to follow me afterwards. So let's bow our head in prayer. So we thank you, O God, for your amazing grace revealed in Yeshua Mashiach, our Lord, throughout your scriptures and throughout circumstances in our lives. We thank you that he now appears in heaven to intercede for us. And he will appear a second time as the great God and Savior to establish his kingdom on earth. 
and to the Lord we are all gathered here to consider this great truth of the death and resurrection of your only begotten Son, Yeshua. How can we ever comprehend this action of yours? And today, two of your children have decided to come forward and to uplift and proclaim your name. Oh Lord, I'm convinced that their voices and action will not only be witnessed here in Bet Ariel, but will transcend again the whole universe to your throne. Bless them, O oh Lord. Bless Celine. Bless Jean Paul. I pray that their spiritual growth, their sanctification will surpass all expectations and that each one of them will become great instruments through whom your spirit will accomplish mighty things on this earth. In Yeshua's name, amen.